So it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Wu. Um, Tim Wu, to me, is a somewhat wonky, very enthusiastic first-year law student in my civil procedure class at Harvard Law School. Um, he's grown up. I, indeed, uh, I walked into my roommate this past weekend who picked up the uh, the program and said, oh, Tim Wu is coming. I said, yes, indeed. Um, I've known Tim Wu for a long time. She said, haven't you read the New York Times? So he has uh, just been featured uh, in a, a major uh, profile. Uh, he is a professor at Columbia Law School. He's the author of The Master Switch, uh, which he did, wrote uh, after being a New America Fellow. He's also been formerly the senior advisor to the Federal Trade Commission. And although we're in the midst of the net neutrality debate, and yes, he did coin the idea of net neutrality, uh, and he is deservedly celebrated for that. He is going to uh, actually uh, talk to us on a different subject, always looking ahead, and his topic is how to disrupt stagnant industry. So, Tim. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I, I love this uh, conference. The big ideas is, is um, uh, you know, it's so much fun. You just talk about ideas. They don't necessarily have to come true. It's, uh, it's uh, just uh, terrific. And thank you for that introduction, uh, Anne Marie. I remember her not as the uh, President and CEO of New America or all the other things she's done, but as a, uh, uh, a, uh, a young law professor with a book with about a million post-it notes uh, attached to it with all the different uh, sections in the civil procedure class. So that's how I remember it. So I'm going to talk today about something that has uh, uh, very little to do with uh, net neutrality, but rather draws on my experience um, uh, both working at the Federal Trade Commission in antitrust enforcement and also having worked uh, at a few startups and having advised a lot of startups and uh, spending some time in the private sector. And what I'm going to talk about is something that is a persistent problem for, the, uh, anti for antitrust enforcers. And I should say that, uh, give some credit to Barry Lynn, who's done a, a, a New America here, who's done a, a lot to publicize this issue, it is the problem of stagnant industries. Um, you may kind of have a, a feeling for this yourself. As a consumer, some products from some industries, just always seem to be getting better. Next time you, every time you buy a hard drive, they seem to be faster and cheaper. Um, laptops, uh, like this one, this is an ancient machine at this point. Uh, you know, they're always getting, the battery lives keep getting better, they get thinner, they're, they're, they're terrific. And then there's other industries where, for some reason, the prices just seem to go up, the products don't seem to get any better, and they just kind of stay the same. And these are what I want to describe as the stagnant uh, industries. And I'm going to say that they tend to have five uh, characteristics. Not all of them, but at least some of them. Um, one is the uh, structure of the industry is often an oligopoly or a monopoly, or in any, in any sense it's uh, dominated by uh, a number of, small number of companies who are able to coordinate uh, their activity uh, easily. Uh, you usually see high profit margins that uh, don't seem to have any particular justification. Um, they are often resistant to product innovation. You don't see any real disruptive changes in these industries. You do often see what you might call cosmetic innovation. They'll introduce some uh, new supposed uh, improvement, which really isn't uh, much than tinkering with the product uh, in an effort to charge a higher price for it. Number four, these industries tend to uh, feature many artificial barriers to entry. Uh, they may be control of the retail sector, um, some control of a resource necessary to the product. Uh, often it's manipulation of government regulation, abuse of the patent system, uh, all things that make it harder for, for companies to get started. Um, and finally, number five, many of these uh, more stagnant industries tend to have uh, large investments in uh, gov government lobbying campaigns uh, to uh, run the regulatory programs. So um, it's always dangerous to name names, but I'm not going to name companies. Well, I will name a few companies, but I won't uh, mostly name industries. I'll give two examples of industries that are, are like this. Uh, consider first the eyeglass industry. It's a large industry, $28 billion. Uh, and you may sometimes go to uh, uh, 
sunglass stores or, or uh, stores like Glen Crafters to buy glasses, and you seem to be pre presented by a selection. Ray-Bans, Oakley's, uh, Prada, Chanel, D DKNY designers. Seems like there's an enormously competitive industry. Uh, the fact is that almost every single uh, manufacturer of glasses um, or every brand is owned by one giant uh, company uh, named Luxottica, and they make all the sunglasses you've uh, ever heard of. Uh, they have one competitor who makes the other ones. Um, all those ones I've mentioned, uh, Prada, Channel, uh, DKNY, all the uh, Ray-Bans, so forth, are actually made by a single company. Um, uh, they own retailers uh, like Sunglass Hut, so if you're in Sunglass Hut and you're looking around, you're like, why are the prices just seem to be in lockstep? It's because uh, they, they, they're all owned by the same company. Uh, they also own lens crafters, other uh, things like that. Uh, and the, um, uh, the profits in this industry are uh, relatively obscene. Uh, eyeglasses, when you think about it, are really just plastic and uh, glass. They're not very complicated. Frames are often uh, north of $300, maybe $400, $500 for designer frames. They cost about $25 to make, maybe $50 at most. And so when you think about it, you charge $500 for something that costs $50. Um, it's a pretty uh, nice business to be in. Um, there hasn't been any serious innovation in the industry. I mean, Google Glass might be the best example, but they're pretty uh, far from uh, getting into it. There are some entrants I'm going to talk about later. And so this, this industry just sort of sits there, and it makes a lot of money, and it is, uh, I would suggest, stagnant and uh, extracts the cost of billions of dollars from uh, American and actually just global consumers. Let me point to another industry uh, similar to this, the mattress industry. Uh, if you've ever tried buying mattresses, you've probably had the experience of wondering why on earth mattresses cost $3,000, $2,000. There is a confusing uh, variety of, of uh, product brands, uh, all of which have names which cannot be compared. So if you ever try to do comparison shopping, none of the stores name their mattresses the same things, even though they're made by the companies. And what I'm sure is a plot, the three major manufacturers all start with S, Sealy, Serta, and Simmons. And I challenge anyone in this room to tell me what the difference is between these companies. So I've never been able to figure. And they occasionally come up with uh, some sort of uh, superficial uh, innovation. Um, you know, they'll have some kind of new gel they have or a new layer of something. But basically, it's the same product. Uh, there has, the, one, the one innovation was the, uh, the, the, the temper, the, the therapy, what's it called? Temperputic. And that, that is, and there were water beds at one point. So occasionally, there, I won't say there's no innovation. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, there they are, they had a layer, uh, they, they, um, uh, th this, is how, this is how they uh, do their business. Uh, sale tactics are unbelievably confusing, I said that. Um, and, you know, one of the tricks, there's two real tricks to the business. One is that uh, consumers uh, only buy mattresses uh, once every five, ten years or something, so they're not constantly in this market and they come and supposedly things are new. It's also extremely hard to really test mattresses. Um, you know, you just lie there for a second and so... <laughs> You know, it doesn't really, so, so this is another industry uh, that is, uh, you know, roughly stagnant and is roughly some kind of racket. Now, the, the, the problem is that um, the antitrust law has enormous difficulties dealing with these industries, and that is for a number of reasons. Um, I just want to, uh, uh, usually, just as a legal matter, um, these industries are clever enough to understand that what antitrust law bans is explicit price fixing. So they understand that. There's no agreements that you will be found to say all mattresses shall cost $2,000 or whatever it is. But what antitrust law does not ban is parallel pricing. That is, if you have the exact same prices um, for things, um, that is not a violation of the antitrust law, and it's been a long-standing uh, problem. The other real problem that antitrust law has is that it's never been clear, even if you wanted to do something about the mattress industry or the uh, eyeglass industry, what exactly can its remedies be? So one thing you can try to do, for example, is, well, discover if they're fixing prices and tell them not to do that. But then they'll figure out some other way about it. Um, you can uh, try and break the companies into smaller pieces. That's an aggressive tactic. It involves a lot of government involvement. If you want to lower prices, you really have to contemplate an involvement of the state in the industries, which is hard to really uh, see as sustainable. I mean, most people, even if you're um, you know, on, on the left uh, of the spectrum, 
have some problems with there being a mattress czar who's going to say, listen, the price of mattresses, I've decided, is $500. You know, take it or leave it. It gets a little bit too much like a centralized economy. So this is the problem, and antitrust law uh, really is uh, uh, strung by it. And I'll say the last thing, which I should have said, is antitrust law is episodic. The enforcers come to this problem, they look at it, maybe for a year or so, and then they're on to some other industry. And so even if they try and do things, even if they break stuff up, even if they have some remedies, the industry, having survived, uh, just kind of gets angry. They have better lawyers, they have better lobbyists next time around, and, um, and they're in it for the long run. So my uh, instinct, or my uh, big idea, is that um, the best uh, uh, remedy is to try to target stagnant industries and introduce natural competition. My, my uh, in inspiration for this idea actually came from uh, our cottage, uh, where we're, we uh, have a problem with uh, too much seaweed. And one of the uh, solutions to this problem, one is pesticides, but the other solution is you introduce natural predators. You introduce these carp that eat all the seaweed. Uh, and farmers sometimes do this with their fields. They'll introduce a, a natural predator to a, a pest. And so what stagnant in industries fear the most, of course, is a new entrant, a company that is going to come in and underprice what they're doing and offer better service and better products and, um, and, and, and take this apart. And often we assume that this is going to happen automatically, but what I'm suggesting is that either as, the an as part of antitrust or as part of some other uh, aspect of government, that government could do more to foster the entry of competitive companies into stagnant industries. And I want to suggest some of the ways it uh, could do this. So uh, idea number one is, um, well, I'll just call the most wanted list. The government um, has enormous uh, powers to get information and to publish information in a credible way. This is one of the government's uh, greatest powers. It's used in securities regulation. It's used... Uh, uh, in the patent law. So one of the things, I mean, often what I notice at the FTC is um, we would investigate an industry or a company, get very far, have an enormous amount of data, realize uh, the weaknesses and the uh, susceptibilities of this industry to disruption, but then just leave that information in a file somewhere uh, right over here across the street in the Federal Trade Commission. So we know these industries are vulnerable. So one thing that government could do is um, either as the most wanted list or more regularly, publish more information about the industries that would be used by entrepreneurs to think, you know, wow, I never knew that the mattress industry was this vulnerable to disruption. Or I never knew that um, real estate, well, everyone knows that about real estate brokers. Um, but, or maybe chairs. I mean, I don't know. So pe because people in business school, they, the, one challenge they have is informationally everyone gets focused on hot industries. You know, most people in uh, business, uh, coming out of business school, entrepreneurs are excited about building an app or, um, you know, becoming the next Facebook, and they're not necessarily thinking of becoming a mattress king. But there might be actually more opportunities in these stagnant industries. It's just that information is not well known, you know, and it's not aware. So if you had greater visibility and more information forcing of the industries that are in a stagnant condition and are vulnerable to disruption, you might see more uh, entrance uh, uh, coming. The second uh, idea is uh, what I call a police escort. So the, one of the problems for entrants in these industries is sometimes people do try to get into them, but um, you know, they're dealing with masters of the game who have usually mastered uh, some anti-competitive measure or another that, that keeps them out. Either they can't find any retailers to carry their products or the wholesaler suddenly won't deal with them or they find their tires are all flat when they go to the parking lot. Whatever it is, there's ways, and they're just like, you don't really want to be in this industry, and so often a lot of entrants get uh, killed, and, um, and it seems discouraging. Uh, the police escort idea uh, is to try to improve um, the protection for new entrants into stagnant industries by the antitrust agencies or other government enforcement uh, uh, powers. And I, I'm not, not sure how this would work, but it would have to be a sort of quicker version of uh, some of what a uh, quicker version of remedies for anti-competitive practices where um, the Federal Trade Commission or the Justice Department uh, could learn of these and say, you know, you better back off that stuff. Because the thing is, entrance, and this is my experience um, uh, dealing with high uh, tech companies, 
Entrants have this advantage that they're, they're usually newer, they've, they've got a better uh, product idea, they're willing to, to price lower. So they just need a little bit of room to get growing. They have advantages, but they have to not be killed in their first couple years of, of, uh, of being in the market. And a few warnings from government can go a long way towards protecting uh, an entrant in a, in a dangerous market. My third idea, this one may be uh, controversial, is an idea of a reward program. A little bit for the lawyers in the audience like Key Tam. So the idea is that you offer some kind of reward to consumers that prove that they are saving consumers money in a stagnant industry. So for example, um, uh, in the eyeglass market, I want to highlight a company some of you may know named uh, Warby Parker which has entered over the last few years. So Warby Parker uh, did a little bit what I said. They noticed that eyeglasses uh, are selling for $400 and cost uh, $50 to make. So they had the idea, or actually more like 25, and they thought, okay, well, we will price our eyeglasses at $95, undercut them by $400, see how that goes. And they're doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> unsurprisingly, they have some retail. They, they kind of did what, what I suggested. And to, in to encourage that kind of thing, you might devise, a, you have to do this carefully, some kind of program where you can, if you can prove that you have can save consumers some X billions of dollars or even hundreds of millions of dollars, that you get some kind of tax subsidy for that. It doesn't have to be a big one, but some kind of tax subsidy so people notice there are prizes out there. So the model for this is, is Key Tam, which is a government program that um, gives people uh, incentives to sue when they notice uh, fraud, people defrauding the government. This is people defrauding the consumer as opposed to the government, but the principle is about the same. So uh, that's my idea. Um, obviously, this would not necessarily be a popular idea in certain uh, sectors. Um, companies would complain that new competition is costing them jobs, government's paying favorites, and um, so forth, and um, I understand that. But I, I think it's also understand, important to understand that uh, economic growth is fundamentally about disruption. And it is, uh, to go back to some of what Secretary um, uh, Clinton was talking about, um, America is about a disruptive economy. It is about people taking advantage of opportunities to try to do something new. And the way this country grows is when the old replaces the new in a constant cycle. So I believe this could be an important idea. Thank you very much. I think I have time for one or two questions. I see one. Uh, I'm supposed to take people in the back, right? So, uh, so I see like a silhouette there in the black back. Is that, yeah. Okay. I don't have no idea. I can't see what it is. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Uh, just a quick question. Why do you think the government is, uh, um, is better than entrepreneur plus investors at identifying stagnant industries? Why is government better at it? Yeah. No, they're I just able so. to get information. Uh, they're, they're able to get information uh, out, of, out of these industries better. They have subpoena powers. And so I, I, I know that, so competitors have limited, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's uh, hard to, to get at, and inf a government has a lot better uh, information forcing powers. Yeah, sure, right in the front, and then that'll be it. Thanks, Tim. Can, <clears throat> is this working? Can I ask a net neutrality question? Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> So my question is, um, what do you think uh, the, what should the answer be here for the, what's in the best interest of the United States, of the people of well, America? This, this does dove dovetail. So w one of the things I would have said if it wasn't antitrust focused is that the uh, most powerful thing for disrupting stagnant economies or, or industries the last 20 years has clearly been the internet. And so one way, a really clever way for the government uh, to get I don't think it planned on this, but when it funded the internet, it did a lot of the work I was talking about. It's probably a better big idea than my big idea, but that's pretty obvious. So uh, part of uh, what, uh, why net, neutral net neutrality is really important because it represents the idea for startups that there is um, an opportunity to either you know, put your product out there and try and reach consumers or for speakers to, to be heard. Um, and, you know, maybe not to succeed, but at least you get your shot. So I think that it's very important the FCC uh, preserve this. I think that it has to do so by uh, uh, banning fast lanes and um, banning all blocking and allowing transparency. And I think the way it should do this is using authority that would make it do it. Uh, they're trying to do it. This will get technical with a, a, a complex legal 
uh, picture. I think they should simply use their main authority, which is known as Title II of the 1934 Telecom Act, and uh, create a net neutrality principle that hopefully lasts for a very long time and is, acts as a Magna Carta for startups for a very long time to come. Thank you very much.